Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks for your introduction. Um, just to clarify, I haven't done anything in SLAM, so my advisor did. I'm more on a path planning aspect, so don't put me on anything if I say anything wrong on the SLAM. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk today about the area coverage path planning. Uh, we'll see some work that uh, how we generate global plans from the graphs and how we do this in field deployments. Um, with that said, just to give an overview of what we are going to talk about today, I will give an introduction what is the coverage path planning. Um, we'll pinpoint some related work that are um, we're going to talk about them, mention about them throughout the uh, talk, so we'll know the, um, the vocabulary. Um, I'll present reviewing coverage methods, um, then we'll talk about multi-robot um, systems and multi-robot coverage. Um, then we will um, talk also about some of the ways how we can handle the uncertainties within the coverage problem, uh, or just path planning in general. And then finally, I will end with the underwater coverage. Um, so what is the area coverage problem? Um, is a task of covering points of interest by the robot in the given area while ensuring the, its safety, where the safety can be defined, for example, avoiding the obstacles, right? Um, the area coverage problem is commonplace in many different domain, domains, uh, from the agriculture to manufacturing, um, indoor cleaning robots, and so on and so forth. For me, particularly, all my research for PhD particularly was um, motivated by the marine explorations, um, in explorations in general, and for marine exploration particularly, and for moni uh, environmental monitoring problems. So that includes the, for example, algae bloom um, surveying or surveying lakes for the bathymetric mapping. And very recently, uh, since I joined the UMD, I started also working with the aerial and ground vehicles for the again motivated by search and rescue and environmental monitoring problems. With that said, why are we still solving the coverage path planning problem? Um, so for one thing, when we have unstructured environments, such as we have this unstructured uh, lake um, map that you can see on the river map, um, the existing classical methods, they are not working well in this environment. Um, and also we have large scale operations that are requiring also a lot of resources. So, um, still coverage problem is often problem in this cases. Um, introducing multi-robot system or heterogeneity into a problem, it's shown that this problem from the algorithmic perspective is proven to be empty hard. Um, and even further, if we go to the three-dimensional three spaces and especially under what the environment, we have so many constraints that are adding to the problem. We have uh, vi limited visibility. There is no um, consistent slam or uh, well working slam in this environment. So classical methods don't work in this environment as well. And finally, let's say everything is fine. We generated coverage path planning given like simple uh, paths, lawn mower motion. But when we're dealing in the real environment, we have real environmental forces that are affecting it, whether they'll be the current or the wind. So with that said, my general research vision is to design scalable planning and coordination algorithms and systems for heterogeneous multi-robot systems that are ensuring robustness to unstructured dynamic environments. To that end, the approach that I am taking um, is to look on the problem from the hierarchical planning uh, perspective. We have this higher level global path planning methods. Uh, then we have planning with uncertainty that we have to take into account. And there is lower level planning, which might include also some control. Information also moving from the abstract representations, for example, that can be the graph representations of the paths to the more precise um, representation, which can be the actions or the control uh, signals. Um, as such, we will start my PhD uh, research has been mostly on this high level path planning um, algorithms. And um, we'll talk, we'll start talking about some of the works related to this uh, topic, and then we'll move forward. Um, but before that, I want to um, mention a couple of works that I will be um, referring to throughout the work. The bootstrap Vedon classical approach is this method um, of splitting environment, decomposing environment into the cells that do not contain any obstacles. Um, and the complete coverage of this region will be applying bootstrap or long mower motion within these regions. So when I refer to B, B, BCD, that's going to be the bootstrap and the composition. Um, then for the graph routing, you will hear me saying the Chinese postman problem. The Chinese postman problem is um, the path planning problem on the graphs that requires to find optimal or 
shortest path that visits every single edge of the graph compared to traveling salesman problem work that was requiring to visit every single uh, vertex of the graph. As opposed to traveling salesman problem, Chinese postman problem is actually polynomial times solvable, but it's MP hard when we are adding multiple agents, multiple Chinese uh, postmans. And then generalized traveling salesman or GTSP is the problem of finding shortest path that visits all of the vertices where the vertex is not a single point, but a set of vertices. And the requirement is that when we are visiting the set of vertices, you have to visit only one um, member of, the, of each of the sets. Um, and then another work that um, um, Anchi uh, uh, did at the McGill was combining the bootstrap adon content composition and defining the coverage problem as a Chinese postman problem, ensuring that you can solve this as a, a, in a polynomial time. Okay, with that said, let's get started with the river in coverage. So what are the challenges in this case? Um, so as I said, we have the unstructured environment, right? If you look on this image, if we were to apply um, on the, on your left, you see um, the image of the, the map of the river where the bootstrapedic decomposition is applied. And you can see that we have uneven areas of coverage, right? We have very long path, passes on some of the areas and we have very short passes. So this is not um, suitable for performing complete coverage for this kind of environment because it doesn't take into account the directions of the meanders, uh, turning meanders and many other constraints, right? Um, on the other hand, um, having um, being this project very uh, much grounded in the applications, one of the things that we have um, observed from the talking to scientists is that whenever they are doing partial coverage of the environment for sampling a um, single point on the environment for uh, getting uh, s some partial information about the environment. What they do, they take the fixed angle turns towards the uh, opposite shore. And this is, they perform the exact type of approach. But they do this fixed angle. And when you automate this approach, you will have the situation that in some areas where you have narrow um, passes, you will have more grains, for example, coverage that you see in this case, or you will have overshooting long distances that, in ideal case, you will have more ingrained coverage uh, within each of these areas. Uh, so frontier based, you don't even need to apply frontier based in this case because frontier based is exploration, right? Because in this case, we have the environments known. Yes, we have the map. Yeah. Whereas if, even if we have the map, uh, so if you apply the frontier based exploration, right, it's going to be very time consuming and um, there's better ways of doing that. Like the idea behind all of this is to understand the algorithmic or geometrical um, properties of the system and how we can use that to come up with better solutions for this kind of environment. Like if we are applying the bootstrap done on this, yes, we can say that just do it and it's gonna work, but it looks like if we're applying it right way out of the shelf, it's not gonna be performing well. And also we take into account the domain knowledge that comes from the scientists, from their uh, experience, how they are doing this kind of operations. So with that, the problem that we're looking here is that given satellite image of the river map, the launching position, uh, sensor footprint size, and how we can find paths. Um, in addition, we have also the type of sensor, but I have to mention the type of the sensor. In this case, there are only two types of sensors that we're taking into account. And this is, not, this is not taking part in the decision phase. This is only as a developers, we have been talking to the scientists to understand what kind of sensors are more suitable for specific type of trajectories. The problem is to find a path for a robot such that it visits all the points in the area of interest in the shortest time with passes suitable to the shortest, uh, to the sensor type, which is again application driven. To that end, one of the first methods that we have uh, proposed for this is to perform longitudinal coverage. Uh, what longitudinal coverage does is uh, splits uh, the river uh, based on the width of it. Um, so we have the basic idea behind it that we will have different size of the passes on each of these areas. Then we degenerate the passes uh, where the pass is the um, single line that if the robot takes that line, uh, 
start following the line, it will actually cover the entire uh, sensor footprint. Uh, we generate the passes, and then each of the passes is used as an input, as a vertex graph in our graph representation. And we, um, the edges of this graph are connecting each of the vertices, vertex, vertices in the corresponding uh, classes. By that, I mean that um, the first cluster is uh, the blue vertices, for example, and then we have the red vertices. And the edges are only in between the neighboring um, clusters. And then we solve the TSP problem. A better solution for that will be to represent as a generalized traveling salesman problem when we have the not just a single pass, but each of these passes have a direction. We are not just uh, choosing um, constant direction, but we can actually decide which air, on which vertex we should go down river and um, up river. And the edges in this case will be connecting all the vertices within the clusters and also the neighboring clusters. Um, Yeah, uh, so for this one, because the way that we have already splitted the environment is, um, uh, yeah, I didn't mention about that. The way that we are uh, generating the passes, they are parallel to the shore. So by itself, we are already reducing the possibility that we will have that kind of information, uh, that kind of cases, right? But the way, the way that we are defining the weight, because this is between the vertices, is just the Euclidean distance between them. But that part that we were having, we are not going to have here because it's already when we are generating the passes, we are making sure that they are longit they are parallel to the shore. Okay. Um, so from this perspective, this uh, from the application perspective, this method is applicable when you have side scan sonar um, because this is minimizing the number of the turns uh, when you are running the coverage. Um, so, okay, we have this longitudinal coverage method that performs well in maybe in some cases, but we have river environment, and with the rivers, we probably can also get more information. Um, it turns out that the, on the outer skirt of the meanders, the um, speed down, down river speed is faster. And on the, outer, uh, on the inner skirts of the meanders, um, the meanders are the concave sides, co concave regions of the rivers, so that there is a... Um, geological property of the rivers that they always have the meanders uh, throughout the year, so they're generating the meanders. Um, and the, on the inner sides of the meanders, we have the downriver um, speed, um, the, the downriver uh, speed of the current is slowest. So we can probably use this information to speed up the coverage uh, pattern, right? So to that end, we need to find the meanders. Um, after finding the meanders, we will def um, cluster the um, area based on this meanders. Every single point on this um, uh, picture, the green and um, orange ones, represents the points of the meanders that we have found. And uh, depending even if they are on the inner meander or outer meander, they will be, um, the outer ones are represented as the green ones and the inner ones are the uh, orange ones. So the way that we uh, cluster this environment is based on where the mean there is changing. So if we're having from the outer to the inner, then we will do the splitting of the environment. And each of these regions will be new clusters. So for example, we switch from V48 to V7. So from that point, we need to cluster environment. So we have to split it. And then we're generating again, the longitudinal parallel to the shore paths. Um, to generate the trajectories. Um, in this case, we do the greedy approach um, rather than splitting the environment based on the width of the area, but that can be also done uh, for the width. But the intuition behind this is that we can apply this within already clustered width environments. So we do this and then we generate even passes and we um, take the um, upriver direction only in case we are on the inner side of the river. Uh, of the river. So with this, we wanted to compare them. Um, well, before going in, into further details about the comparison of them, um, to complete the scientific operation um, that um, scientists will be taking, one of the things that we have been observing that there are operations that longitudinal coverage is not optimal. Because 
if you are doing the sentiment transfer study, you rather go quickly um, um, perpendicular to the river because the information, the, the speed of the river is moving the information. So you want to gather that information as quickly as possible to understand how the sediment is transferring. So, um, it, no, it's, uh, it's, a, um, it's a Dubin's vehicle in this case, but it's not taken into account in this case. It can be in the longitudinal, but not for this part. Um, so in this case, again, we have this uh, pattern that is just perpendicular bootstrapped on uh, motion um, along the river that will ensure that if you have um, sediment transfer study that you can just apply that. Um, from the scientists, like our experiments that we're doing, like it will be like a couple of hours just to run and to collect data and do the measurements. Um, but for the scientists, it, that they are doing this throughout the period of time, right? So, uh, for example, if you are doing the algae, you even have these sensors that are located in environments, and then you go collect data around them. And then you go, depending on if something new happened, right? If there was rainy season or something, you go again and collect data more and more. Um, if there are scientists, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we do. We were collaborating at South Carolina with um, a very large group of scientists that are studying archaeology, and they do this consistently all the time. Um, and then we automated also the Zeek and Zach coverage method that they will take. But in this case, we are offering instead of doing the fixed angle, do the make sure that the Zeek and Zach that are generating um, creating the more uniform distribution of the sample points uh, through. Um, defining the equal triangle method. So rather than doing the fixed angle, every time when you are selecting the new uh, sample method, we have to make sure that Zika decks have close to equal triangle sizes. Um, so all of these trajectories, they were offline. We have the offline map, they are generating maps, uh, they, they are generating waypoints, and now we have to um, execute them. For that, we have used this Mokai Jetyak platform that we made autonomous in our lab at the University of South Carolina. Um, for the control, we used PIXOC controllers. Uh, the data was collected and handled with the Raspberry Pi and also the ROS is hosted on Raspberry Pi. Uh, but we also used the Intel NUC as well uh, for more time consuming, more energy consuming sensors. Um, we have also deployed multiple different types of sensors. Um, the Cruzo DSP single ping sonar is the one that we usually will use. And the other two sonars have been provided by the geologists that were working with us. Um, so here we see the execution, the GPS coordinates of the uh, um, meanders uh, compared to the longitudinal coverage. Um, these are very large experiments, like very large distances, um, like running the um, experiment on, the, on your left. Um, it took about three hours per one um, experiment. And um, you have also taken into account that when you're doing these experiments, you have this human-sized jet yak, so you cannot just leave them and go do your job. So someone has to be there in South Carolina, kind of degrees um, temperature in the summer and do this experiment to collect some data. Um, so with this, uh, when we compared this experiment, it turned out that, um, yeah, we even had like about almost four hours experiment. Um, it turns out that Minder, even with this greedy approach, it outperforms the longitudinal coverage method by 20%. So using this simple information that was coming from the intrinsic properties of the river helps to fasten the um, coverage uh, or the planning method. Um, here you see the execution on the top of different uh, patterns, l covered longitudinal, transversal, or, and zig and zag in the simulation. And on the bottom, it's the uh, projection of the GPS coordinates that we have uh, from the experiment. Um, uh, I'll ask you to pay attention that the trajectories that we have generated, that were they were kind of um, straight lines, but here on the execution, you will see that they are very wobbly. And we'll see how we can actually handle this as well later on. Um, since the Z cover is the only partial coverage method, we had to compare it with the fixed angle heuristic that humans were using. And um, the qualitative lead, we see that we have more uniform uh, coverage even though we don't have that much qualitative um, improvement on the uh, equal triangles. 
Um, on the other hand, for the complete coverage method, which are the L cover and T cover, we have that we compare the return path and the total area covered. Uh, and we see that because the way that the T cover was designed, it doesn't take into account the return path. It was really like the strophatic pattern. Uh, whereas the L cover uses the traveling salesman problem and it knows, uh, it takes into account the return path cost as well. Um, so with all the sensors that we had deployed, we collected all the data and we also performed the bathymetric mapping of the environment. Um, so um, the, there are in the paper also more details about different from different trajectories how the um, depth map looks um, but these are just a sample of how the how we use all the data that we are collecting from the field so as such the um, riverine coverage provides three different type of coverage patterns the longitudinal uh, transversal and zig and zag we have also mean their base covered algorithm that outperforms the longitudinal approach by decreasing coverage time on average by 20 percent and we have performed extensive uh, field experiments with 35 kilometers total distance traveled uh, with over two kilometers square area covered. Yeah, so this was single robot case, right? So now we are moving into multi-robot coverage case. And as I said, it's known, it, it has been proven to be amply harmful from the algorithm perspective. So the problem that we're looking is again, offline path planning method, uh, coverage path planning. We have satellite map, um, of the interest region. There is no communication between robots. The motivation behind this because we are operating in a marine domain where the distances between them are very large and sometimes we are in a remote places where the communication is almost impossible to ensure. Um, we have the number of the agents and the vehicles have dubbing constraints. So they, they are not able to turn um, without the turning radius. Uh, so they have minimum turning radius. The problem is to find again complete coverage path for each agent, but in this case, each of the agents should have equal operational time with min minimal overlapping areas. Um, so when we're solving this problem, it's important to define it as a min-max problem. Min-max problem is when we are minimizing the maximum route of a single um, robot. In that case, we're ensuring that, uh, as opposed to minimizing the total time, when we are solving min-max, we ensure that only one robot is not doing performing the entire job. So we are distributing the work accordingly and utilizing them. Otherwise, we'll have the situation that we have in this comic. Um, so for that, we proposed um, the methods that are similar to, uh, well, the ideology is the following. The, you uh, route first, you find a path for a single robot, then you cluster that for multiple robots. Or you cluster the environment for each of the robots, and then you plan for a single robot the route. Um, so as such, um, the first algorithm that takes into account the Dubin's uh, constraint as well, so it takes into uh, it takes inputs the binary image uh, turning radio sensor footprint. Um, I'll go into details how the DCS algorithm works, but it splits the environment. Um, it, it, it it generates single robot trajectory and then takes into account how many robots they have and splits that uh, using um, F FHK, which was the K Chinese postman problem that I mentioned at the beginning. And eventually we will have K routes for each of the robots and then generate waypoints uh, for the robot to traverse. So how the, this DCH part works? Um, sorry, DCS. Um, so we have the satellite image. We are performing Bootstrapped on decomposition, the VC decomposition, where each of the cells do not contain any obstacles, right? Then for each of these cells, we generate passes. Again, the pass is the straight line that has the size of the sensor footprint. Uh, for each of the passes, we assign direction, similar to what we were doing for the river and coverage. Um, each of the directions um, shows you which direction you want to move. Because we have the Dubin's constraint, so the cost between each of these vertices will be defined using taking into account the turning radius as well. It's not going to be just simple the Euclidean distance in this case. Um, each of the passes, because they have um, the direction also selected, we will be solving the GTSB problem on that, right? As a result, we will get um, passages where we have passes that have already assigned direction for them. 
And using that, we are performing clustering. And the clustering um, will be based on the following um, formulas. Um, so LJ is the cost of the cluster, which is defined by um, taking into account. So for example, we have multiple robots. We know that the robots have traversal and also cover regions, right? So traversal means that they have to travel from the starting point or wherever they are located to the location they have to start performing the coverage, right? So that means there is an area that they are going to be just doing the straight line or maybe just avoiding the obstacle and going to the location they have to start working. Um, so we estimate this taking into account the maximum distance that they have to travel in order to, um, to um, reach the cluster, the farthest cluster and what will be the size of the single uh, route to cover in that area. So that we distance to that area, to the uh, cluster, plus the size of the cluster for the coverage cost, and then the return cost. With this, we are making sure that each of the robots will have equal amount of work uh, to perform. Um, so, and the other approach is is the opposite. Rather than doing planning first and then uh, clustering, it actually clusters the environment using the same type of clustering approach. And then for each of these regions, it, it, it finds, it solves the single robot coverage problem, which was the one that I described earlier. Um, here you see the experiment um, using the both of the methods, one with uh, clustering first and routing second, and the other one uh, routing first and clustering second methods. Um, the experiment showed on the different environmental um, images, um, they showed that uh, when we are doing a routing first, um, we have more optimal uh, solutions. And we are comparing, because it was min-max problem, right, we have to compare maximum coverage cost per robot. Uh, and with that, we see that in case if we have five robots and 10 robots, we, are, uh, we have that um, routing first and clustering second, it performs better. Again, the experimental platform has been the same. The generative waypoints have to be executed on the, um, the JTIAC, uh, Mokai JTIAC. But in this case, we do not have the external geology, uh, the, the external sensors, sensors that were provided by the geologist. Um, here, the experiments are conducted um, using uh, two and three robots. Um, the, uh, one of the robots, the wonky trajectory, shows how dif difficult are the field experiments. All these three robots, they had the exact same hardware. Everything was tuned in the same way, but it turned out that there was some tuning pr um, problem with the steering of the third robot, and we only detected that after performing the experiment, um, which didn't show up on the first one where we have the two robots working and performing everything right. Um, okay, and because uh, we saw that from the simulation experiments that the route first cluster second was more optimal, we only used that method for the real world experiments. Um, so this was covering a lake in South Carolina, about 200 um, on 200 meter area. Um, we used one, two, and three ASVs. Um, sensor footprint was set to 4.5, and we have turning radius for ASVs, uh, five meters. Um, just a reminder that ASVs had the Dubin's constraint. Um, and we have that the maximum distance for two robots were kind of close to the ideal distance. And uh, this is, it shows that it's uh, lower. Uh, this is um, related to the fact that the cluster size, the, the, the way that we are defining the cluster size is more, is more conservative, so it has to take into account the farthest points. So if the cluster size was very small, then uh, it was smaller than the ideal distance, then we will have situation that the maximum cost will be uh, lower. And then we have for the third one that uh, they are uh, close to each other um, also. Um, this is the execution of the um, experiment with the three boats. Um, so what we achieved, we have this multi-robot offline coverage path planning method um, that is communication-less and it's complete. Um, two approximation algorithms has been extended for the Dubin's coverage, uh, for the Dubin's vehicles, and over 200, um, 200 meters area has been covered with um, up to three ASVs. 
Okay, so going back to the this hierarchical planning. So we have talked about all these um, offline um, higher level planning algorithms that are generating these waypoints. And now, but we, we, we saw that the trajectories, they are not perfect, right? They are not ideal. And we have situation that instead of straight line, we were just doing wobbly uh, coverage. And that affects the coverage because the aim of the coverage is to perform complete, co gather complete information about the environment with minimum amount of overlaps. So how we can plan with uncertainty? Um, so this is a perfect example that um, uh, my colleague Jason Malcolm, when he was working on his PhD, he did this experiment how the environmental forces will be affecting the trajectory. So he generated the yellow uh, paths uh, in the uh, control in the um, Q ground controller, which is the controller for the ASV. Um, so they are ideal straight lines. And he made uh, them aligned with different in the different directions. So we'll see from different directions how the wind is actually affected and the current also affected. And we see that again, the executed ones, the white ones, they are not perfect. They are not straight lines at all. So what we can do, um, we col collected the current uh, data and also the wind data, the water current and the wind data, and we approximated them for the regions that we're interested by the Gaussian processes. The way that we can use this, either use, um, assume that the changes or collect data throughout many trials and assume that the changes are not significant and use that for the next trials for augment the controller or for augment the waypoint. Or we can use directly those readings to use the supervised learning to estimate what will be the, um, um, the change from the actual, the ideal waypoint and what was actually being executed. Um, so in this case, uh, we show that if we are augmenting this information right away in the controller, we will be able to achieve more straighter um, coverage, uh, more straighter paths. So on the top, again, we have the, um, the red ones are the, without the controller that is augmenting the information from the uh, wind and the current. And on the bottom, we have the, execution with the controller. Sorry. Uh, we have the wind and current sensors. Uh, so the for the current there, are, um, it's kind of, um, I don't know the name of it, but um, the, like it's an encoder. So we have to have, yes. So we have to have, that, that's for the current and also for the wind, it's also similar to the encoder. So for each of them, for the current particularly, we have to have four of them mounted on each of the sides. So we will do the transformation for that and to see the direction and also the current. But for the wind is only like the direction uh, and the current. Um, any questions so far? Okay, then I'll continue. So that was about the environmental aspect, right? Uh, but then we have also, we're dealing with the robots that have also some energy constraints. Um, at the at the University of Maryland, I started working with the um, aerial vehicles as well. So the aerial vehicles, as we all know, they have very limited time of operations, maximum 30 minutes. Um, we were uh, using the uh, commercially available uh, drones for the education purposes. Um, so we we talked about this global plan. So if we are planning some global trajectories in this manner. For each of these robots, we have some trajectories that they have to, uh, they have to is it right, execute. But what if they are unable? So what is the way that we can overcome this problem? Uh, one way will be if we have UGV, that it's a ground vehicle, that is capable of charging the UAV, we can come up with the solution, we can come up with a problem that will find the rendezvous points of each of these uh, vehicles, right? So we have, we generated this trajectory from the offline plan. Now the problem is how we can use these offline trajectories and the information about the stochastic changes of the energy consumption of the robot to come up with, uh, to find where and when the robots will be meeting in order to perform um, coverage or um, moving in the environment. And the objectives are to minimize the total time and the probability of running out of the time. Um, the way that we approach this problem, um, and also I want to mention that this is work that uh, 
um, I've been working with um, different students, and Gongeshi is uh, he's the one who is uh, who has developed uh, these algorithms. Um, the the way that we approach this problem is to come up with the risk of error. Planets. Rather than doing minimizing the expected time, which can sometimes be brittle. So, for example, if you have 50 times of the time that you are successful and the rest of the 50 times are brutally wrong, that's still minimizing the expected success time, right? Um, whereas the worst case optimization can be too conservative. So, the idea is to come up with these risk aware planners that will lead to more robust performances. And um, for achieving that, we are minimizing the probability, uh, maximizing the probability of the success. Or in other words, we are minimizing the probability of uh, getting into the failure mode, which is getting out of the charge. Um, this problem has been defined as the MDP. And as you know, the MDPs are very time consuming. And the, with the, um, if we increase the state space, it will be intractable. And, as a reminder, we're working with the real robust. All of this has to be computed on the real system. So solving this problem for the entire horizon would have been impractical. Hence, this is where it comes the global planning and separating the problems into smaller chunks. Okay, um, so the, in the previous picture, you saw the simulation um, executions. Um, the, the left picture shows the um, generated waypoints and on the um, right you see the actual trajectories that have been generated with the rendezvous. Um, the simulation results show that um, you can see that with the low risk tolerance uh, we have lower um, empirical failure rate and also with the low risk tolerance, we have the average number of the rendezvous armors because the robot will be choosing to, if it's avoiding to fail, it will be choosing to meet more often. Um, this is work in progress. The experimenter set up for this ex um, experiments for this particular project are the M500 voxel drone um, that is still using the PIXOC uh, controllers as in the um, case of the um, ASVs. And for the ground vehicle, we're using ClearPad Jackal ground vehicle. Um, so the idea will be that UAV is going to be detecting the AR tag and blending whenever the waypoint has been detected to be a rendezvous location. Right. So this was a way that we can incorporate some uncertainty. And uh, when we have solved the global plan, we can come up with the tractable problem uh, definitions for uh, incorporating the answer. And um, now we can talk about lower level planning. Um, so underwater coverage. This is kind of falls under the category, not only just low level, but also handling uncertainties in a way. Um, and we'll see why. Um, just to mention, there is this um, work that our, um, has, has motivated our research, um, which is uh, comes from, again, McGill University. Uh, Travis Manderson and his colleagues came up with this method of monitoring coral reefs. So what they did, using human uh, knowledge of traversing into environments. So for example, as a human, we know that there is some structures in visiting some interest points, right? We see them, we recognize them, and we want to go towards that location. So they have used the similar um, idea of labeling the data on based on the preference of the human, how they will um, navigate in this area, with an objective to visit, to cover, um, or, uh, to cover the uh, coral reefs while avoiding the obstacles. In a similar manner, um, what we wanted to do is we have this underwater environment, right? We don't have slam underwater. There are some, but they are not very reliable. And doing this type of coverage methods that I was talking about is impractical in this environment. Um, but we also have domain knowledge about the environment, right? If it's a shipwreck, as a human, I know that it kind of has a structure. I know that I have to follow the sides of the shipwreck, and then there is a mass. I want to go around it. And maybe I can use this as a diver, as a human, to teach the robot how to do the navigation in this case. So as such, the problem that we wanted to solve is only having RGB, RGB image information and 
underwater robot that has all three uh, independent degrees of freedom, how we can come up with some strategies with behaviors that will add step towards uh, covering shipwrecks. Uh, and for that, we wanted to find a plan that will navigate the robot, uh, teach him to demonstrate the following uh, behaviors. One, keep the shipwreck in the um, field of view. Two, follow the shipwreck side, turn around the bow and stern to the ship, and circumnavigate the most, the mast. So each of these behaviors separately, if we apply there, they might not end up covering the entire area, but these are behaviors that if we have in combination, they will result in good uh, coverage. Um, what we did, we used the similar approach that Travis uh, Manderson and his colleagues has done. Uh, we asked a diver to see the pictures and label them as they will be navigating. Um, they will label by changing the yaw and the pitch of the robot. Um, in this um, image you see on the, on the left, um, example of the label data that will show how much the pitch and the yaw has to be changed. And we have used this, uh, the similar network that um, in the previous work they have used with um, slight modifications, which is based on the RASNET um, network to, to do this supervised learning using only uh, image to come up with the uh, plan or actions for the uh, navigation. Um, the most important aspect of this work is the data collection setup because we cannot do the labeling if we do not have data. And this is also a dangerous operation as well. And there are not that many shippers that you can go freely and uh, collect the data. Um, so the setup that we have used, one of them was the stereo rig um, setup, where we have um, stereo camera setup configuration. We have IMU um, pressure sensors, um, the computing um, the power, which is the Intel NOC, and the sonar. Within this project, we only use the uh, camera information, but all of the other um, data will be used for enhancing this in later aspects. And um, this is me collecting the data on the uh, Stavro Nikita shipwreck uh, using the sensor. Um, to perform the experiments, not only we have used the data that we have collected from the steric, but we also use the aqua robot to navigate over the shipwreck. And also we use the GoPro cameras. So all this data was used in our training. Additionally, we have also used the, we have also generated the data from the um, artificial data, which is the uh, NOAA um, uh, shipwreck models that have been provided by the NOAA that we used in the gazebo simulation, drive the robot around, collect data, how the navigation will be working. Um, not surprisingly, when we are performing the training, on the simulation, and then we do testing and validation on the real world data, the results are terribly bad. And the vice versa, when we do the training on the real world and test it on the simulation, again, we have a drastically bad performance. But if we do the testing and training on the same um, environments, uh, we will achieve approximately 80% accuracy. And um, to make clear, the data has been used for the training um, six to two. So 20% uh, of, of it will be for the validation, 20% will be for the training. Um, but we were able to achieve some convergence. Um, we see here that we have some of the behaviors achieved. Um, the robot has been traveling and then it's detected that it's actually leaving the shipwreck. Uh, so it comes and keeps the shipwreck on its uh, side, side of view. Um, this is a mesh that was provided by NOAA, so we did not reconstruct it. This is the data that we're using for the training. Um, the method that we have come up with is only vision-based. Um, it's, it's a step towards the autonomous 3D coverage. It only provides 80% accuracy on direction prediction. Um, the collection, we have provided a lot of data that we have collected from the uh, two shipwrecks. In Barbados, um, achieve two objectives. We only have been able to achieve two of the objectives of the initial four, which is the keep shipwreck in the field of view and follow the side of the shipwreck. Uh, there is no localization for this. Th this is the main constraint of it. So you don't have localization, you don't have anything, you only have the camera information and how you will be able to do navigation. Yes. 
Uh, this is the training um, accuracy validation and uh, the testing accuracy. It is measured on the um, the um, on the prediction on the prediction of the direction. So if you had the labels that were first, in this case, if I see this image, I'm going to go toward like the 30 degrees only changing the yo, you will be comparing with that. Because the output is also change of the yo and pitch. Um, well, it's uh, RMSC, so you're going to be collecting like the average. Yeah. It's not going to be just zero. Question at this point. Um, well, I'm about to finish. Um, so, what is what if the interest region has been changed? So, the the project that we were motivated, what they were doing, they were actually doing monitoring of the coral reefs, right? What we did, we we changed this to the shipwreck. Um, intrinsically, there is more complication when you are switching for a field that it's only um, coral reefs, where they are kind of similar, where you want to do navigation around more complex structure. But what if the interest region is something similar to coral reefs? Why do we have to do every time the training? Why it has to be depending on the data? So this is something that we're thinking with um, Xiaomin Lin, who is PhD student at UMD, um, advised by uh, Dr. Yanis Alimonos. Uh, so we wanted to extend this work that I have done for the shipwreck mapping to see if we can actually come up with data invariance solution. And the question that we're still trying to answer, is if we have classifier for the environment, if we have classifier about the uh, interest region, can we actually reduce the training step and just every time use whatever train only once and use that trained uh, controller uh, for any type of interest regions. So this is something that um, we're thinking about and this is something for the future work that I want to leave you with and for the thoughts. Um, so we're coming back to the vision that I had and the hierarchical planning that I was taking. We talked about this very high level offline coverage path planning methods that are maybe impractical when you're applying in the real world, but in combination with taking into account the uncertainty of the environment and maybe local uh, level planning methods, they will be able to be more robust in the real world. So with that said, um, I want to thank um, everyone for coming to this talk. Um, um, I want to thank my advisors, Yanis Riklitis, Brad Abdelkar, Dinesh Manoch, and my um, collaborators, Dr. Yanis Alimonos, Gongeshi, Ahmad, Bila, Xiaomin Lin, Dr. Jason Moulton, Alex Johnson, Adam Roth, Jason Wrighty, um, the funding resources, and Dr. Kosa Zanidis for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, that, that's something that we have done with Jason Moulton, and um, I don't remember how we did, and this was quite a while, but yeah, thanks for reminding me about it. So uh, the way that we did, we splitted the rivers into clusters, right? So if we're to looking onto um, L cover, right? So we split that based on the width. So you have now parallel two parallel lines that the distance between them are almost the same, right? So what we did, we are generating parallel to the shores trajectories. So you have, let's say, I don't know, if the distance between the rivers is about um, 10 meters, right? And your sensor footprint is going to be, I don't know, uh, 2.5, right? So you will have only four passes in this case, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. It's not changing. Yeah. But um, that's something that we have been thinking about. Um, 
if you have, when you are doing the coverage of the lakes, you have depth information. And depending on the depth, where if you are on a shallow water or in a deep, deep water, your sensor footprint is actually changing. And that's where you can use that information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the method that I have uh, showed you, it's not taken into account the online things. Everything is offline. Um, but the online method, the idea of this is that if you have very large environment, right, if you solve this online, it's intractable. You cannot do that. But if you have this large, vast environment and you can split this into, the, not even think about from the perspective of multi robots, right, you can even split that in different sub problems and within sub problem you can apply learning method that will actually take into account the state of the environment like for example the method that i showed with the uav and ugv there we on a tractable size of the problem we are able to solve mdp but if i were to do this at the very beginning the state space just blows up explanation but once you have generated that the tractable problem you are able to define it as MDP and solve the online version. Um, I did not, but if you have that information, what you can do instead of treating the entire environment for um, either that will be for bootstrapper or anything else, right? You can use that map information and each of the edges that you are creating will have incorporated that weight that you have defined in the original map. So if you have an area that has more density or it's more challenging, right? You can have actually like type of elevation map of kind of thing, right? That gives you the cost information. but that type of thing is more, it's better handled with the online approach, not online approach, but learning approach or MDP approaches, right? Because you can incorporate the state space information in the planning um, part. Yeah. Um, heterogeneity should be designed very clearly. So for example, the multi-robot system, it can take into account if you have different turning radius. That can be handled with it. But because the constraints are already like either sensor footprints or the turning radius, like the inputs, whatever you have the inputs, if they are different, that will be able to handle. But if you are adding something else, um, which is the uh, um, speed, for example, velocity of the robots, as it is now, it will not be able to handle it, but there is probably way, well, no, velocity will be handled because velocity is very simple. You will just estimate the cost of the edge. But um, for very specific, yeah. 
of well in a sense it's an exploiting right because i'm i'm using that information to have better coverage so i'm i might be able to assign more areas to cover to robot that has maybe larger sensor footprint than i will be dividing to the equals right so i'm exploiting that property that this robot has by itself but maybe the way that you're thinking is a bit different you want more exploitation yeah yeah but no the, Online taking that into account and making decision based on that? No, it, it cannot be. because inherently the things that I presented at the beginning they are all offline, and they are for very large scale uh, operations. I'll be very interested, and I'll be if you're a PhD student or masters or your students just in general. I'll be very happy if you reach me out and we can work on it. If you have time and you are interested in this problem. And for everyone, I'm a postdoc, so I'm very happy to collaborate with anyone. If you found any of this project interesting, please reach me out, and I'll be happy to chat with you. Uh, regarding time. The, the, um, distance traveled, which is correlated with the time. Yes, it's complete coverage. It's minimizing the time traveled um, or distance traveled, right? Um, and plus, we have also obstacle avoidance objective, which is this bustropedon part of it that uh, squeezed the environment into the regions with no obstacles. Will extend to 3D. The world I couldn't. That's why I went and collected data and did learning. <laughs> Whenever you can, you just do learning, right? That's what we do. <laughs> um, I mean, you no, know, by itself, like that method probably. Um, well, for 3D, if underwater, it will be impossible because you need state estimation. No, not impossible. Still, there are some methods, and in our lab. Um, one of my colleagues, um, Sharmin Rahman, she worked on the state estimation underwater. Yeah, yeah. But uh, she has the methods for underwater um, state estimation, so we can use that um, in that perspective. No, but why I said we couldn't do that because I I wanted to do it without state estimation, so it will be more applicable. Yeah. There is work with from other groups that they have extended not exactly 3D but two and a half D for underwater environments like bustropedic type of uh, coverage. Thanks a lot. Thank you.